my partner and I had just finished a little, uh, like a lunch break. We never really went out of service. We just ate while we were on duty. Um, got a big plate of barbecued ribs and sat in the projects and, you know, right in the area and ate them and uh, heard a call come out of a woman screaming. A woman screaming for help, possible rape in progress at an address at 28th and Ohio. I didn't see anybody leaving the house or I didn't see anybody in the alley. And I walked over to the window and I was peeking in the window when I saw Officer Tess and Officer Menard walking from the kitchen to the front door area. We kind of worked our way through the rooms. I could tell where he was because of the flashlight. And Larry was about, I'm guessing, 10, 12 feet in front of me. And he had bent over the suitcase, and that's the last I remember of, of that. I don't like to see somebody get by who are murdering somebody. And uh, it's just plain and simple. You know, when you're investigating homicide, there's a saying that you are uh, in that man's shoes to see that he gets justice. And I always did believe that. You know, how is that dead man going to get justice if you don't do it for him? Well, that's my principle. A week after the bombing, Officer Larry Minard was buried. The police were convinced the Black Panthers were responsible for the killing. We were under constant surveillance, constant harassment. Uh, a great deal of energy and uh, <clears throat> resources were spent uh, on trying to provoke us into a confrontation. One, you know, involving shooting, of course. Uh, we couldn't leave. Uh, we couldn't leave a building and enter the streets without being frisked, uh, harassed. Uh, this went on around the clock. Not a night went by, man, that somebody wasn't absolutely, totally, unnecessarily pounced upon by the police. Not a night went by, man. This was like seven days a week. The Black Panthers published a newsletter called Freedom by Any Means Necessary. David Rice was the editor. We did on occasion talk about the whole business, you know, in the newsletter of, of having a right, well, we talk about it more than occasionally, about having a right to defend yourself against police attack. And we're talking about all the P, and we're serious about this, then we're talking about urban guerrilla warfare, and we're talking about people using their brain. And you don't use your brain by throwing some bottles and some bricks and some pigs and doing some cruises. You off the big by the means that are available to you, which can be easily obtained. Both David Rice and Ed Poindexter were visible in the community. And uh, David Rice was uh, very free about what he thought the answer to these problems were, and they generally included killing police officers. Uh, Ed Poindexter, not as vocal, was always present, always around. Marvin McClarity was one of the few black police officers in Omaha at that time. I knew I had feelings that they were out to get those two because they were probably the most, uh, the, the two that were most vocal. They were the two that uh, people viewed as being a threat, the police did. Well, there wasn't a policeman on the job that didn't know who done that. It was just the matter of being able to prove it. And that's what we've done. A week after the bombing, officers Jim Perry and Jack Swanson led a raid on David Rice's house in North Omaha. 
Rice was in Kansas City giving a speech at the time. He'd left his house unlocked. Both Jim Perry and Jack Swanson later testified they found a box of dynamite in the basement. Other officers aren't so sure. Marvin McClarity is convinced the dynamite was planted after the area had been cordoned off. I was on duty. We saw them bringing uh, items out of that house. The thing that was so striking to me and to those uh, two officers that I was with was the fact that the police had blocked off uh, 29th to 30th on Parker Street and they blocked that off to vehicular traffic and to pedestrian traffic. Then they said they found something in that house and uh, being a police officer, the first thing that strikes you is funny and saying, hey, something's wrong here because of the way that that search was conducted. And uh, that was when we drew our suspicions that it could have been something that was planted in that house. And uh, to this day, I still believe that was planted in that house. It's a lie. I was there, I found it. Uh, I didn't personally discover it, but I was there when it was discovered and went right to where it was. <laughs> it was there. They found dynamite in my house. I had guns, you know, in my house, but those guns were legal, you know, registered in my name. I would have been very cautious about even somebody pre presenting the idea of having something in my house, you know, that somebody could get some time for. Because I always suspected that there would be some kind of raid. Although the police had the dynamite they claimed to have found in David Rice's house, they lacked any firm evidence to link Rice to the bombing. The next stage in the investigation came when the police were tipped off that one of the bombers was a teenager called Dwayne Peake. Acting on information developed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, agents of the FBI and investigators of the Omaha Police Division arrested Dwayne Peake, charging him with first-degree murder in the bombing death of patrolman Larry D. Menard According to Dwayne Peake's uncle, once he was in custody, he told the police he'd made the bomb with members of his family. At that particular time, David Rice and Ed Poindexter's name wasn't even mentioned. Uh, it was sometime later, I guess in the morning, when people came in and they, they wanted some good, I, I believe it's scapegoats or however you want to put it, they wanted something sensationalized. They wanted to go after the people that was that were making headlines, I believe. According to his uncle, the police weren't interested in Dwayne Peake's story. They put pressure on him to implicate Rice and Poindexter in the bombing. There were statements made to Dwayne like, uh, you would be the youngest individual that would die in the electric chair. Um, there were statements like, uh, you know, your family probably would suffer. He killed a police officer and, you know, it was a frightful experience. So it was uh, very traumatic. Uh, 